Hi guys, uh, happy Besaki to everybody and uh, it's uh, time to get to uh, solving MCQs for today and uh, it's uh, really nice interacting with you guys after a long hiatus so I think that your preparation is going very smooth and uh, I would be here to guide you with respect to how to uh, get your eyes locked on to the right target because as I always say that uh, uh, you see, all of your brilliant people, uh, you can always rule out two options, but between those remaining two options, there will always be some kind of, you know, confusion present. So the today's session is like a, a sword sharpening session where we tend to improve on our, uh, uh, I would say, controlled guessing skills. Uh, one cannot be sure because you see the topics that are asked are, uh, they can be a lot of depth in a question of any set and, you know, don't be under uh, impression that uh, it 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 will you always be usually a question paper that will look relatively easy but at the same time uh, you know the options would be very very tricky so a false sense of uh, security comes in when we are solving these questions not that i'm trying to scare you but that is what usually happens so uh, uh, the, the options would be you know having that twist present of an except or uh, you know all are correct except so somewhere down the line, we have to figure out uh, how to, you know, uh, get get our eyes locked onto the right target, especially when you have to select more than one correct option. Uh, that is when I would say the real uh, man in you comes out and you get into that beast mode, the aggression mode, and then you start solving questions. So just give me a quick confirmation with respect to the audio and the visual part. And I think we can get started for today. Uh, you know, um, it's a festival day, but uh, great that you guys are uh, joining me on on this auspicious uh, situation. And uh, our objective would be to focus on uh, the questions at our current disposal. Okay. So, yes, guys, uh, just waiting for a quick confirmation. And then I think uh, I am good to go for today. Uh, the first question uh, deals with a child and then the couple of technical aspects which are also given in this one. Uh, child having failure to gain weight, then there is uh, vomiting episodes that are increasing with the intake of milk and eggs. So, I mean, a lot of uh, data that is coming in there. Right, and uh, to gain weight. Okay, great, great, great. So, uh, hi, Dr. Shireen. Um, happy Bisaki to everybody. And uh, let's uh, try to get solve. Uh, let's try to solve these questions for today. Okay, Ji. Uh, fine. Uh, I am having a two and three as answers for this one. Uh, okay, mostly I'm getting a three as an answer, a small intestinal mucosal biopsy, and then also a anti TTG antibody. So let me just uh, explain the question uh, to you guys. You see, he's having failure to thrive and gain weight. The main complaint in this case from the mother's perspective is that the child is having vomiting episodes. But she's saying that uh, these vomiting episodes tend to increase on intake of milk and uh, eggs. But there is no diarrhea present in this case, which makes it a little unlikely that this would be a case of celiac sprue. But uh, considering the fact that most guys are thinking this to be celiac sprue, my only question is that uh, if it is celiac sprue, then celiac sprue will always be having a presentation of osmotic diarrhea because see, uh, whenever there is going to be damage to the microvilli, the brush border epithelium, the total surface area, uh, surface area related to absorption will become relatively less. And uh, in this question, there is no mention of any diarrhea given. So it's very, very unlikely that this is not celiac sprue. Plus, uh, he is also mentioning that this child is having features of atopy. Uh, considering that there is bronchial asthma that is given in this question that tells us that there is some kind of an allergic component which is present here. Uh, also suggestive of this allergic component is that the eosinophil count of this child is relatively elevated and uh, considering that uh, we are having a lot of information given with respect to eosinophilia, well first what we need to understand is that if we combine the two informations here that is atopy allergy eosinophilia and there are vomiting episodes with some kind of allergy to specifically milk and eggs milk and eggs uh, the common thing would be the protein component so the clinical diagnosis in this particular case would be not celiac sprue but would be answered as eosinophilic uh, esophagitis uh, guys uh, please uh, uh, do not always assume that uh, every MCQ that they're going to give you in the exam is going to be for celiac sprue because celiac sprue, as I mentioned, right in the first line, uh, right in the third line, it is written that there is no di diarrhea present. So the diagnosis of this particular case is eosinophilic esophagitis, which will change the entire perspective. 
the answer to this question is not option number three uh anyway like even if we, we were thinking you know even if we were thinking in terms of uh you know uh the celiac sprue then i mean why would we do spirometry because in our case we have already in this particular case uh, what we have already done is uh diagnosed him as bronchial asthma and he's already on inhalers so uh three uh is not the answer guys the correct answer for this one would be an upper g endoscopy and along with that what we'll do is a esophageal biopsy also and then we'll be able to confirm the diagnosis because uh when i'll be doing a biopsy I need to demonstrate that there are more than 15 eosinophils uh, present for high power field. Uh, let's just read this question once again. Yep, we get a feline esophagus. We uh, track, uh, The terms used would be like tracheolization of the esophagus. So, I mean, that's the key for this question. And I'm just going to quickly read this question once again so that we can get the uh, options right. Uh, you see, uh, he said that this is a five-year-old child who's brought by the mother. There is failure to gain weight. So first line, you know, traditionally malnourishment and then he's talking about vomiting episodes, but no diarrhea. So initially, because yeah, why there is a vomiting, you know, that's the interesting question that has come up. So in eosinophilic esophagitis, there is formation of stricture in the esophagus. And that stricture is the reason why there is a development of vomiting in this case. So I think... Uh, uh that would make it yeah topical steroids yeah so may i'll come to the treatment part but then uh you know when you read this question it categorically says there is no diarrhea present and only vomiting episodes present that should make us think in terms of possibly a uh, esophageal pathology and since he has mentioned regarding uh, the presentation of uh, eosinophilia, then he's mentioned that patient is already on, the doctor has already put him on inhalers for bronchial asthma. He is given eosinophil count being elevated. So if I look at all these parameters, uh, that will make it much more, uh, you know, relatively much more easier for us to comprehend. And because option number A is the only one correct, the correct answer for this one is uh, one, as Shirin has mentioned subsequently. Uh, how frequently do we need to do spirometry? No, once spirometry has uh, has identified a diagnosis of a disease, then you don't need to repeat spirometry. It's a diagnostic tool. And for home monitoring of asthma, we have our PEFR meter that I have spoken about uh, subsequently. Okay, so somebody is saying why uh, C also. If C, if somebody is already a diagnosed case, if he has already been put on illness for bronchial asthma, Pyrometry will not give you any any new evidence for diagnostic purpose. Maximum what it will tell you is that uh, uh, maximum what it will tell you is uh, whether the attack is mild or moderate or severe. And for that you are having even a PEFR that is peak expiratory flow rate also. So uh, you know that uh, that will make it relatively easier. And then somebody also commented why only for milk and eggs because milk and eggs would be having proteins and proteins the human body has more tendency to uh, have allergy towards proteins and that is why you know that uh, uh, that milk and the uh, milk and the eggs component has been mentioned in the question and uh, why the patient has been put on an inhaler the patient has been put on an inhaler because uh, he was suffering from bronchial asthma because in eosinophilic esophagitis there is a coexistent atopy most patients of uh, please read up eosinophilic esophagitis from uh, the subsequent uh, data and uh, you know then you will uh, understand this better uh, then somebody said what change in the question will make it celiac sprue then there has to be diarrhea there has, has to be stratoria there has to be malabsorption described with no mention of any uh, bronchial asthma that is present so yes yes uh, uh, somebody says biopsy is required or not so without that i cannot confirm the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis uh, well what are the features we one would be having peripheral blood eosinophilia histology showing i mean because we need to demonstrate uh, the the eosinophilia component that is why and uh, then apart from this uh, you know the mnemonic for remembering the features of uh, eosinophilic esophagitis is phase where they would be peripheral blood eosinophilia, then histology would be showing uh, eosinophils. There has to be presence of atopy present. There has to be stricture in the esophagus. And yeah, 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 I'm coming to tracheolization and there's a stricture present. Because of the stricture, there is an esophageal food impaction with dysphagia and the symptoms tend to increase, especially when, you, when the patient is pro uh, taking proteins. And then endoscopy per se will be showing features of tracheolization of the esophagus. Uh, well, what do you use for the treatment of this condition? You will be using steroids. So person can swallow topical steroids. Budesonide is a very good option, which will help in treatment of this condition uh, along with PPI that is proton pump inhibitors. And uh, as far as somebody mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the tracheolization component, uh, I've just shown an endoscopy image related to the same. 
and uh, then uh, ppi and swallow topical storage for treatment as i mentioned stop six things you know eggs have to be stocked milk has to be stopped soy then nuts seafood wheat have to be stopped initially and then a gradual reintroduction of these have to be done and most of the time uh, isnophilic esophagitis will be having a pediatric presentation because a uh, lot of the time kids who are having asthma could be simultaneously having this complaint as well so uh, somebody mentioned why have we put the child on inhaler because of the coexistent asthma component uh, would we do a biopsy in a child well in a evidence uh, in a scenario of evidence based medicine it is advisable to do a esophageal biopsy uh, if the mother refuses, I'll say not a problem. The child is anyway being produced, put on inhaler. So uh, we would be giving inhaled corticosteroids. But along with inhaled corticosteroids, what you need to add for the management of this condition is uh, proton pump inhibitors, PPI. And then you also need to allow topical, swallowed a topical steroid, right? So inhaled part would not go into the esophagus because that's where the local inflammation is present. And uh, I mean, once we go ahead with this treatment, we'll be in a good position to solve it. So yeah, I think this was basically basically a googly and uh, uh, the question was you know in form of a googly and uh, uh, might have caused you to think in terms of a possibility of a diagnosis of this condition as celiac screw so uh, currently we are sorted with this question and uh, let's move on to the second question for today where a boy has been brought by his father who has noticed him having agonal respiration agonal respiration is like the breathing that would occur in somebody towards the end of life like you know that that terminal breathing that you see in uh, extreme old age in a person who might be dying but today we are having a young guy who is having this agonal breathing which is a terminal breathing and uh, well when the ecg was performed the ecg is showing a saddle back pattern of st elevation in lead v2 and v3 uh, routinely what i've explained is that for uh, this particular condition that is uh, brugada syndrome uh, we tend to have a diagnosis with cope pattern but uh, today the question is slightly modified uh, it does not say cope pattern it says a saddle back pattern so uh, you have to pick up that slight difference that is also given in this question i'll be explaining the importance of this in a while and let's have a quick voting with respect to the answers that would be coming in because uh, either it can be a cope pattern or it can be a saddle back pattern uh, while i draw it i i'll i'll give you a few more seconds to think about this question and the various permutation combinations because in myocardial infarction we'll be getting a st elevation like the one that i've shown now let's look at how the cope pattern would look like so the cope pattern uh, this is p then this would be a ST segment elevation and then there's a T wave inversion. So whatever hand drawn before you is uh, a curve pattern. And then uh, let's focus on the saddle back pattern also, which can be seen in patients of Brugada. And uh, it's gonna be slightly different guys. So I just want you to pick up this uh, change that I have currently shown here before you, where you are noticing this saddle back appearance. So uh, there, there are two possibilities. In Brugada, one is Cove, second is Saddleback, and there are two varieties of Brugada also. Cove pattern is type 1 and Saddleback is type 2. Yes, uh, since I have given a uh, substantial amount of inputs, uh, most guys are getting it right. Uh, this particular condition is a sodium channel defect. So option A is correct. That is uh, loss of uh, voltage gated sodium channel. And where is this uh, sodium channel defect present? So, I mean, this particular uh, defect would be present in the right ventricle itself but then at the same time it is in the right ventricular epicardium here it says right ventricular outflow defect so that would not be a technically appropriate statement and then the treatment of choice for this condition would be an implantable cardioverter defibrillator and if i'm gonna use flaconide for this condition flaconide basically blocks sodium channels what uh, flaconide does is that it will block the sodium channel and uh, if you block the sodium channel already there is a loss of function of the sodium channel so there would be worsening of the condition of this patient and uh, that is why in these patients uh, uh, death can occur so the correct answer for this one would be option number a and c and uh, uh, why it is early morning episodes well they can occur at any point of time it is just that it's a incidental finding uh, just like mi occurs in morning hours stroke occurs in morning hours so terminal events usually tend to occur in early morning hours the possibility or the pos plausible explanation i can say is uh, vasoconstriction is more in the body in morning hours so the stress on the heart is also more in the morning hours and therefore i mean usually we get cardiac events uh, created and uh, uh, yep, uh, it says right ventricular outflow defect. See, uh, the problem in this condition lies in the right ventricular epicardium. 
I mean, uh, why it is not ABC is because this condition could be having a not a right ventricular outflow, but would be having a right ventricular epicardium defect present. And this term sometimes may be associated with even a bundle branch block as well, uh, or a bundle branch block pattern on the ECG. But as such, what I can say is that when I say the word right ventricular outflow defect, then uh, uh, there's no physical obstruction that is present. So it's more of a channel defect in the right ventricular epicardium, which is why I have uh, uh, emphasized here. The correct answer for this one is um, option number one, A and C are the correct statements and flecainide rather is gonna uh, worsen the management of this condition. Yes, Jaya, you write that uh, flecainide is used in WPW for prophylaxis purposes. So yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you're right uh, that it's, it is a more of a non-structural defect. It's more of a channel defect that is present uh, in this condition. And uh, as far as types of Burgard are concerned, well, uh, you know, uh, the multiple varieties. So I just want you to remember these two terminologies, which is that uh, Brugada can either be having a co-pattern or it can be having a saddleback pattern. And then we have a type three also. You don't need to get into type three, which can be having either of the two findings. But then uh, what I just showed before you all just emphasize once again, uh, that's the co-pattern with the T-wave inversion. And then you can notice this saddleback. So, I mean, uh, though it was really nice that you guys were able to pick it up, but I think initially when you read this question, you might have missed this word saddleback. So these are again two types of ST segment elevation, which uh, I have currently mentioned before you. And uh, let's do a quick activity. The correct answer for this one is uh, uh, option number one. And uh, I will do a quick activity with respect to sudden cardiac death. So, I mean, that is uh, important uh, for us to solve. So, let, let's have inputs here. Let's uh, have inputs for point number one. Yes, guys, uh, just waiting for your inputs here. Uh, in case uh, there's a sudden cardiac death and there is going to be... Uh, delta wave doctor will be occurring in the upswing of the R wave. I mean, if you're saying delta wave, then has been discussed subsequently. I mean, the movement of the P will finish. The movement of the P will finish, there would be a change in the slope of the upswing of the R. So delta, I don't think so, will ever cause an issue because that's in the upswing of the R. And here, whatever I said would be present with respect to uh, the terminal part. So uh, that is one. Uh, okay, so uh, I think most guys have got it right. Uh, QT more than 600 milliseconds would be long QT syndrome. And uh, long QT syndrome would be having usually an arrhythmia. That arrhythmia would be in the form of torsidus D pointers. So absolutely right. I mean, sudden cardiac death would be occurring with the TDP. But uh, then the technical answer would be that there would be LQTS, that is long QT syndrome. Then uh, epsilon wave would be seen with the uh, ARVD that is uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Uh, this would be again occurring in the terminal part of the S wave. Uh, so I think two is sorted. Uh, somebody mentioned hypothermia. No, hypothermia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Romano Ward and Jerval Lange Nielsen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. For this, you know, the specific names would be, though these are varieties only, but then long QT syndrome would be either uh, Romano Ward syndrome or Jerval. Uh, Jervell Lange Nielsen syndrome, JLN. So, good one. Uh, uh, in hypothermia, we'll be having uh, J waves present. So, anyway, we are discussing epsilon wave that is ARVD. Then, for co pattern, I've already explained to you this would be type 1 Brugada syndrome. Uh, when it comes to saddleback pattern, it would be type 2 Brugada syndrome. So, one, we just need to remember these two terminologies. Delta is the easiest one that is Wolf Parkinson White. Everybody knows that. Uh, the treatment for WPW is however different from others in a sense that others might be requiring a ICD, a implantable cardioverter defibrillator. But uh, as far as, uh, yeah, yeah, good, good, good. I am having good inputs there for uh, most of the data. Yes, and uh, MYH7 gene, this would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and titan gene would be mainly for dilated cardiomyopathy. So yes, I had very good feedbacks for sudden cardiac death. Definition of sudden is within one hour of either being seen or heard normally. And there are like seven permutations uh, with respect to SAD that I thought that I should mention on one single slide just to get the, uh, you know, the data right. And in all of them, the treatment of choice would always be a implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Uh, the only scenario where you are going to be not using a ICD is where there's an accessory pathway. So I'm going to get rid of this accessory pathway going ahead with RFA. That is a radio frequency ablation. For all of them to reduce mortality, it is always a ICD. 
so good inputs for the second one for today for uh, uh, most of the people and let's now focus on the third one and this uh, yep yep and uh, for the next third one which is hot favorite of our examiners i mean they started this with inicid then they put it up in uh, the fmg exam also so uh, you need to basically just get uh, the data right for uh, endocarditis as far as the updated guidelines and uh, suggestion for you guys who are going to be sitting for the inicit exam very soon uh, i have published a new video in the main section in the app uh, for uh, infective endocarditis update in that update i have included all these uh, 2023 modified dukes criteria these criteria are not given in the latest edition of harrison uh, if he does not mention the updated criteria, we will still answer by updated criteria of Harrison where we take three sets of blood cultures, uh, two bottles each, right? And that would be at gap of one hours only. So that three to one still holds. But uh, if ever he goes into this updated criteria, which is done two times till now, the last INISAT exam and uh, the FMG exam. So we need to get the you know, data right for this one. And again, suggesting you guys that please go through uh, the main section uh, in 6.0 where I've just given a small update. It's like 30 minutes. You can listen to that in 15 minutes at 2x also because you know about infective endocarditis. So let me just solve the question for you. Uh, guys, in the major criteria, they've added a new thing, which is that intraoperative inspection. Like for example, a patient is undergoing some kind of a, a cardiac surgery, like a valve replacement surgery itself. And or uh, you know any any kind of procedure, cardiac procedure is being done on the patient, and the cardiothoracic surgeon at that point of time finds that there is uh, damage to the valve. So intraoperative inspection is now a part of the major criteria for diagnosis. Like you know sometimes the damage might be very limited and may not be visible on echocardiography, but it might be visible intraoperatively. Like there is a paravalvular abscess. So paravalvular abs may not be visible on echocardiography and for that either we might have to go in for a FDG PET or we might have to go in for intraoperative examination findings. So one I wanted to remember that now intraoperative findings or intraoperative inspection findings have been added to the major criteria for diagnosis of infective endocarditis. So option number A is a correct statement. Then uh, for typical organisms, typical would be like, for example, uh, Staph aureus or typical organisms would be like coagulase negative Staphylococcus. So for typical organisms, we always be, would be requiring two sets of blood cultures. But if it is atypical organism, atypical organism would be like Bartonella or atypical organism can be like Coxella. So for uh, atypical or non-typical organisms, he's still saying that you need three sets of cultures. So both B and C are correct, guys. There is a differential now. He says that the timing is gone. I mean, there is no time lag required. Like you need to take earlier, no samples had to be taken. Like three sets had to be taken at gap of one, one, one hour. Now he says that there is no need. You can draw all the samples at a single go uh, from a single site. Earlier, it was different vein puncture sites. You see, in the older edition of Harrison, it was still three to one. In three to one, it was that you need at least three sets. And each of these set would be having two bottles and it was not mentioned separately aerobic bottle anaerobic bottle like like it is mentioned now it was three sets or two bottles at a gap of one hour but now he has removed those guidelines and uh, this is why i mean we are discussing this update that it is two sets for typical and uh, three sets for non-typical organism and as i explained to you that if it is a paravalvular abscess then there is a high probability that the paravalvular abscess can be missed on echocardiography. So he's added new investigations also. And one of the new investigations that is added is cardiac CT. Another one that is added is FDG PET also. 18F, 18 fluoride, then fluorodeoxy. This, this F is coming two times. This uh, so first F is fluoride. And the second one is obviously the fluorodeoxy glucose. So it is F alpha by two times. It is 18 F FDG PET, which will help up uh, pick up paravalvular lesions. So the correct answer for this one, guys, is option number four. That is all the four options are correct. And uh, uh, I think most of the time uh, I got inputs. Uh, yeah, yeah, in flaconide used in WPW in arrhythmias. Uh, uh, Tane, uh, in WPW, the main treatment would be radiofrequency ablation. That would be what is required, catheter ablation. And uh, uh, flaconide is only if, in case the catheter ablation has not been done. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah.
so sample can be collected uh, sample would be collected from the vein only know how to collect sample from atria i mean that would be very very difficult so it would be sample collection would be primarily from the venous sample. it would be a venous sample only which is best and easy easy to obtain so uh uh no doctor no doctor uh we do not get a delta wave with respect to hypothermia that would be a j wave or a osborne wave yeah coxilla is a single culture that is okay but then uh, all these parameters are correct and we just need to practice these uh, uh, data and uh, though it will sound a little overwhelming for you but i just want you to focus on the core issues see echocardiography is still a part of the criteria in imaging but over and above this he has added two more investigations there and i am coming to pcr rm i'm coming to pcr we can do pcr we can also do metagenomic sequencing uh, for identifying the bacteria because blood culture is anyway good enough blood if blood culture is not available or patient has taken antibiotic then i'll do a pcr i can do amplicon i can do a metagenomic sequencing investigation mein nayi cheez kya hai pehle ye nahi hota tha cardiac ct nahi likha hota tha to ye add hua hai then 18 fdg pet ct add hua hai aur imaging mein usne surgical component bhi add kiya hai that is a intraoperative inspection if there is absence of any findings on cardiac imaging or histopathology तो सबसे पहले तो आपको याद क्या करना है कि जो मेजर क्राइटेरिया है उसमें क्या चीज ऐड हुई है तो तीन चीजें ऐड हुई है कार्डेक सिटी एफ डी जी पैट और सर्जिकल क्राइटेरिया दैट इज इंटरऑपरेटिव इंस्पेक्शन इज हेल्पिंग इन डायग्नोसिस ऑफ दिस कंडीशन वंस यू गेट दैट राइट देन कम्स दैट एस्पेक्ट कि भाई सपोज मुझे माइक्रोबायोलॉजी का टेस्ट uh, करना है एंड आई एम नॉट बींग एबल टू गेट गुड रिजल्ट विद कल्चर तो कोई दिक्कत ही नहीं है मेरे पास पी है PCR नहीं तो एम्पलीकॉन है मैं थोड़ा जूम इन कर लेता हूँ ताकि आपको फॉन्ट थोड़ा बेटर हो जाएगा तो PCR सी आर एम्पलीकॉन एंड मेटाजोनॉमिक सिक्वेंसिंग कैन बी यूज टू आइडेंटिफाई द ऑर्गेनिज्म सो वी आर ट्राइंग टू यूज टेक्नोलॉजी भाई हम ब्लड कल्चर पर सिर्फ रिलाई नहीं कर रहे हैं हम ब्लड कल्चर के बियॉन्ड जा रहे हैं कि भाई नए वाले टेस्ट अवेलेबल हैं तो हम उनको क्यों ना यूज़ करें ताकि वी आर एबल टू इंक्रीज अवर डायग्नोस्टिक फील्ड सो दैट्स द बेसिक फोकस फॉर दिस पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन and uh, yeah the i mean the table looks bigger but uh, these are changes in the major criteria so to total major mein char point bolunga char point kya kya hai cardiac ct add hua fdg pet add hua uh, surgical criteria surgical component add hua ki intraoperative inspection and usage of technology that is pcr amplicon or metagenomic sequencing whatever may be available so total char point ho gaye major mein ab batata hu aapko minor mein kya kya changes hain listen to this carefully guys minor criteria mein kya kya changes hain तो माइनर क्राइटेरिया में देखो जो आ, जो रोटीन वीडियो लेक्चर था जो हैरिसन पे बेस्ड है तो हैरिसन में मैंने बोला था कि स्प्लेनिक एफसेस और सेरिबरल एफसेस जो होता है वो इसके कॉम्प्लिकेशन होते हैं वो डायग्नोस्टिक क्राइटेरिया के पार्ट नहीं होते थे लेकिन अभी जो अपडेट है उसमें स्प्लेनिक और सेरिबरल एफसेस जो है जो स्प्लेनिक और सेरिबरल एफसेस है उसको उसने वैस्कुलर फिनोमिन में एड कर दिया है सो बेसिकली यू नीड टू जस्ट गेट दिस फैक्ट राइड कि नॉर्मली तो हम पढ़ते थे ना कि स्प्लिनो में गैली हो जाती है स्प्लेनिक एफसेस होता है इन्फेक्टिव एंडोकार्डाइटिस के केस में बट देन द वर्ड स्प्लेनिक एफसेस वॉज नेवर अ पार्ट ऑफ द डायग्नोस्टिक क्राइटेरिया इन द ओल्ड वन बट नाउ हैज बिन एडेड और एक और चीज़ जो एड हुई है वो है न्यू ऑनसेट मरमर पहले के जो न्यू ऑनसेट मरमर होता था ये मेजर क्राइटेरिया का पार्ट था ये जो न्यू आंसर्ड मरमर था ये मेजर क्राइटेरिया का पार्ट था और अभी उसने उसको माइनर का पार्ट बनाया है तो ये चेंजेस है टोटल मिला के पाँच चार और दो छः चेंजेस है मैं चेंजेस फिर से मैं क्विकली गो थ्रू कर रहा हूँ थर्टी सेकेंड्स में कार्डेक सिटी एफ डी पैड सर्जिकल और ये पी सी आर एड हुआ और ये चार हो गए और दो यहाँ पे हैं स्प्लिक एफसेस और मरमर अब पॉइंट ये है कि आपके माइंड में होगा कि सर दो दो डेफिनेशन कैसे याद करें तो जब तक हैरिसन में अपडेट नहीं होता अगर टेक्सट बुक में टेक्सट बुक में अगर अगर वो ये अपडेटेड क्राइटेरिया नहीं बोलेगा अगर वो अपडेटेड क्राइटेरिया नहीं बोलेगा तब तो आप हैरिसन के हिसाब से आंसर करोगे बट यस अगर वो अपडेटेड हैं तो फिर हमें उसके हिसाब से आंसर करना पड़ेगा सो यस 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 डॉक्टर आर एम आई थिंक आई आई आस्ट यू ऑलरेडी द पी डी एफ ऑफ दिस वुड बी अवेलेबल the pdf of this would anyway be available so that will make it easier for you and yeah yeah uh, doctor majority of data is what i'm speaking in english only it is just one or two points that i said in hindi okay okay haan ji pcr is also in, uh, doctor pcr dono mein in, uh, pcr aur amplicon jo hai na that is depending on ki wo typical ya non typical organisms ki baat kar rahe hain but in any set we'll have to answer according to the updated criteria only so that is my suggestion to you guys and as far as 
uh, I mean, you know, the microbiological criteria, you can see PCR being used for coxella burnity because the coxella burnity is uh, almost impossible to diagnose on basis of culture. Similarly, is the case with Bartonella, same is the case with Proferma vipulae. So, if I talk about those non, if I talk about those difficult to culture organisms, there it will always be advisable that we are able to uh, identify them on the basis of the test that I have currently mentioned before you. So yeah, I can use indirect fluorescent antibody also, especially for Bartonella or for, um, I mean, Bartonella Hensley. But the point is, in simple, in simple words, the concept is that if it is uh, fastidious organisms, then PCR will be used. So this, uh, this is an update, guys, which I would like you to be thorough with. And the correct answer for this question is uh, option number D, as I mentioned. And in case that word, uh, Modified use criteria is, yeah, your positive blood culture for coxilla is still valid. That is perfectly fine. That uh, perfectly fine. I mean that uh, if I say that uh, it's going to be one culture for uh, coxilla, that's okay. But as I said, you know, it's a fastidious organism, nasty one. So in those circumstances, I mean, we have to be very, very considerate. Okay. So let's uh, take care of the next question, which is uh, more based on the ABG reports. And uh, let's have a quick voting with respect to what do you think is the correct option for this one. Uh, in the first one, uh, you can notice that the pH of the patient is 7.5. I'll just zoom in the slide a bit so that the options are a little more clearer. Uh, pH is 7.5. Uh, that means there is alkalosis present in this guy. And then you are noticing that the pH, PCO2 of the patient is 51 bicarbonate is 36 if i add 15 to 36 it will still become 51 so that makes it easier for me to work out that this would be a case of metabolic alkalosis because all the arrows are going in same same direction and uh, because there is a formula also getting satisfied in this case so this is metabolic alkalosis with the respiratory uh, uh, compensation in fact that itself will solve the job for you though there i'll, I'll do the practice for the remaining ones also but in one question only, I just wanted to put pressure on your mind with respect to multiple reports being present. As you know, if all the arrows are going in same same direction, we will say it is partially compensated. And I've also used the modified Winters formula uh, to actually emphasize on that uh, component of uh, partial compensation. Then let's look at the second ABG report. There is an acidosis present in this chap. Uh, but you are noticing that PCO2 at the moment is only 40. That is normal. Uh, but at the same time, the bicarbonate of the patient is less. So it is telling me it is metabolic. Uh, uh, you know, the acidosis component is anyway present and bicarbonate is less. So it is metabolic acidosis. And in metabolic acidosis, normally we have hyperventilation. The guy should breathe out and the CO2 should become lesser. But in this case, at the moment, the compensation has not started. And that is why we will say that this would be an uncompensated uh metabolic acidosis uh one uh, d and two c are making sense and then uh for the remaining two abg reports you can very well see that ph is becoming normal though the remaining parameters are deranged that is because there is a full compensation present here so for the third abg report what you need to focus upon is that uh, this particular case the pco to the patient is less but uh, bicarbonate is also less so the point is you need to first figure out what is the problem in this chap if the PCO2 is less, that means the guy could be hyperventilating. And because there is a hyperventilation, carbon dioxide, if it is less, protons will be less. And if protons are less, bicarbonate values will also become less because kidney will start losing protons. See, in respiratory acidosis, because protons are more, so bicarbonate has to rise. But in respiratory alkalosis, the bicarbonate has to become relatively lesser because there is less protons being produced. So option number, uh, uh, the question, the, the third ABG in this question will fit into a fully compensated uh, respiratory alkalosis. And that leaves us with the remaining one option only. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to bring to your notice, I mean, how did I say fully compensated? Because pH is normal. If the pH in this case was deranged, you know, if it was obviously the uh, pH going towards 7.5, I'll say that it is a, a partially compensated case. But uh, thankfully, thanks to the bicarbonate uh, becoming less because of the effect of the kidney, because the kidney losing the bicarbonate, the things are becoming relatively easier. So that is my take on uh, the options which are present in this particular case. And uh, yep, yep. Do we need to... Uh, uh, yaar, ABG ke report jo hai na, wo main videos se aapne karna hai. Matlab, aise easily samaj nahi aayega. So you need to focus on the core aspects. Phir bhi I'll try once again, you know, just in case uh, you could not figure it out. 
so uh, the option number one all arrows are going in same same direction it's metabolic alpha losses uh, in the second report what i can see is that uh, ph is less so there is acidosis acidosis can be due to two reasons only only metabolic or it can be a respiratory one metabolic well it does not uh, it makes sense because bicarbonate in this patient is less but pco2 is normal that means that respiratory component is not there so i said it is metabolic acidosis and compensation has not started so guys i would suggest that now there are three videos for abg in the main section and if you can just go through them that will make it relatively easier uh in four ph is 7.4 then how it is uh in in the fourth one okay okay why it is acidosis why it is acidosis because pco2 is 60 no if pco2 is 60 carbon dioxide produces carbonic acid man and carbonic acid is acidic you know the very basic concept the carbon dioxide is an acidic molecule carbon dioxide produces carbonic acid that is why the value would be relatively elevated in this case so go through the abg section guys and uh, you'll make more sense and i had very good input there i think everybody got it right for option number a for this one so we are sorted for question number four and let's look at uh, the fifth one for today uh in this one what i've tried to explain is uh, the x-ray findings in this case uh where you can see there's a complete whiteness in the chest x-ray of this chap and uh, then you can also notice a tracheal deviation that is happening the tracheal deviation is happening to the contralateral side so uh, let's have a quick voting here with respect to a and b that i've currently shown both are having a hemithorax but the slight differences are that in one of them uh, there's a trachea like if this side is the mass then you can see the trachea is going on the contralateral side and in the other one you can notice the fact that uh, the i mean the uh, uh, okay let's have a quick voting and if i say anything more the diagnosis in this patient will become relatively much more clearer for you guys so uh yep guys whatever you feel like is the correct answer for this one yes 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 so what you have to understand is what you have to understand for this particular question is that uh, this person could be having probably uh, a lung cancer that lung cancer could be causing a malignant pleural effusion and that malignant pleural effusion in then is then pushing the trachea away so I'll, I'll just do markings here like if this is the lung of this chap what is happening in this chap is that there is a big big effusion present and that effusion is causing the entire area to appear white and uh, now what is happening is this massive because there was a lung cancer present in this chap the lung cancer has resulted in uh, massive pleural effusion pushing the trachea contralaterally so a is a thoracic mass and once you are able to work out that A is a thoracic mass, I'm having only two options which are having thoracic mass present, then B would be relatively easy to work up because the whiteness on option number B cannot be a pneumothorax. The whiteness in B cannot be a pneumothorax. The whiteness can only be explained by the lung collapse. And you can notice a slight tilt of the trachea towards the same side, which is uh, usually a feature with respect to segmental collapse. So the correct answer for question number five would be option number D that there is a thoracic mass and then there is a lung collapse which is also happening so yeah that was good responses by almost everybody yeah cool cool so i think we are we are done with this one why not a loculated empyema loculated cannot be picked up on the basis of uh, x-ray loculations will require ultrasound but empyema will have a biconvex appearance you know just like a pleural effusion has a concavity then uh, you know, uh, uh, whenever it's an empyema, empyema always will produce a biconvex appearance, but loculations can always be picked up only on the basis of, uh, uh, you know, uh, an ultrasound only. So what you're saying is why it is not a loculated empyema. See, empyema will be producing symptoms much more earlier instead of creating a hemithorax in a patient. Yeah, yeah, split pleura sign. That is, Neera just put that very aptly. What I was calling as a biconvexity is called as a split pleura sign. And, you know, a, a patient who's having empyema, you don't need so much of pus accumulation. I mean, the guy will die if there is so much of pus accumulation. It has to be much more lesser present. Uh, the collapse component, doctor, the trachea is coming to the same side, no? The tracheal shift is coming to the same side. That explains probably there could be a foreign body uh, maybe present in the main bronchus, which could be explaining the development of lung collapse in this patient. 
and you would have to see see uh, uh somebody is mentioning about pneumothorax ka tracheal deviation uh pneumothorax only tension pneumothorax causes a contractile deviation guys if it is a spontaneous if there is a spontaneous pneumothorax it will contribute to ipsilateral deviation so one please don't be under impression that pneumothorax always causes a contralateral pneumothorax does not always contribute mark my words there pneumothorax does not always contribute to uh, development of a uh, i mean uh, a contralateral shift that is valid only for tension if it is spontaneous pneumothorax it would be an ipsilateral shift that would be present so i think that would make more sense in this particular case uh Yep, yep, that's right, that's right, Pratyush. Yes, yes, the trachea would come to the same side, exactly. So it's coming to the same side only, you know, doctor, in a segmental collapse. And in the other one, it's going to the comp composite side. A can be a, a massive pleural effusion. Uh, yeah, me, it is same, no? Whether I say massive pleural effusion or I say a thoracic mass, this meaning of this word thoracic mass is that there is a lung tumor. Meaning of the word thoracic mass is that there is a lung tumor. It's a very small lung tumor. But that small lung tumor, what it is causing is a malignant, massive, pleural effusion. This option number A does not mean that there is a tumor present, guys. I mean, it does not mean that it's a whole big tumor present in the whole of the chest. No, 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 no. It is a malignant, massive, pleural effusion, which is present in this particular case. So you need to get, uh, uh, you need to understand the, the fine words in English here. He basically means a small lung tumor only, but he's using the word thoracic mass for the same. Okay. Yeah, collapses on the left hand side. Yeah. Uh, in uh, 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 Dr. Khan, you see uh, pneumothorax can be either spontaneous or it can be a secondary pneumothorax. If it's a secondary pneumothorax, it can be an ipsilateral shift as well. But tension pneumothorax is always going to be always a contralateral one. Okay, geez. fine guys, I think we are sorted for this one. Uh, and uh, finally, if I was able to explain this, then uh, that is cool. So you, they, they're going to give you combinations of ABGs to test your presence of mind. They're going to give you combinations of X-rays and that is just going to put pressure on your mind. See, the topics would still remain the same. They'll still ask you ABG. They'll still ask you X-rays. The same thing, pleural effusion, pneumothorax collapse is the same thing that is being asked. It is just that in a single question, because two, two diseases are put up, that puts a bit extra pressure on mind. And here you are, you're doing great. I mean, majority of you are being able to solve these questions very uh, yeah, in a very, uh, I would say, rocking in a great way. So let's uh, move on to the next one for today, where they love to ask about curve 65 score. And uh, then we are having this 70 year old uh, woman who's admitted with cough and breathing difficulty. And uh, vitals, the pulse rate is about 100 per minute. Uh, BP is on the lower side, uh, not fitting into curve. Uh, uh, I would say curve uh, 65 criteria of 90 by 60. But yeah, considering that the age is very much there, age of the patient is more than 65. Uh, okay, lights criteria are for pleural effusion. Lights index is for pneumothorax, but we are currently focusing on uh, uh, curve 65 score. The age is on the higher side, guys. Then respiratory rate of the patient is uh, more than 30. So that makes it a score of 2 and uh, considering that the patient is drowsy and is not able to talk also so i'll add up another point you know ideally it should be like words documented like confusion disorientation but still i'll say that uh, since the patient is drowsy because of hypoxia i'll say that the curve uh, 65 score of this patient is the total value of three and considering that uh, the total value is three the patient will need admission into intensive care unit and uh, every time a patient is admitted into a intensive care unit, uh, I mean, I'm ruling out option number A, we have to give beta lactams to these patients and then we can be adding respiratory fluoroquinolones. So uh, I think uh, septrioxone is not used. Yeah, blood urea nitrogen report is not given in this question. So that's okay. But still considering that age is on the higher side, respiratory rate is uh, more and the patient is drowsy as well. It's an ICU management. And for these patients, uh, if it comes to option number C, amikacin, I mean, we do not use uh, amikacin or uh, uh, aminoglycosides for management of a case who's having a community acquired pneumonia. Uh, the auscultatory finding of bronchial breathing is confirming that we are dealing with a case of pneumonia plus there is a consolidation as well. So this is a right middle zone pneumonia. I mean the final diagnosis of this guy 
is a curb score of 3 with a right middle zone pneumonia he needs an icu admission and uh, respiratory rate more than 30 per minute you know here it is 36 respiratory rate more than 30 is the criteria that we take into consideration so this is rmz pneumonia plus because the the opacity is anteriorly located so that is why i'm saying right middle zone and uh, i need to admit this guy and between ceftriaxone and ampicillin sulbactam the correct answer would be option number b that is the uh, ampicillin sulbactam that is uh, beta lactam we need to give in this patient Yes, yes. For empirical meningitis, we use ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. Exactly, Neeraj. You, you're right in that. Uh, for empirical meningitis management in adults, we use ceftriaxone vancomycin. But in this chap, it would be beta-lactam. And along with that, we'll be using respiratory fluoroquinolone. So since this patient has not had any recent admission, I mean, though there is presence of, you know, there is a fast breathing in the sky, uh, there is a confusion or disorientation that is documented. So, I mean, I'm talking about a severe case. And in severe case, we, we use beta-lactam and we use a macrolide or we can be using a beta-lactam plus a respiratory fluoroquinolone. So, if you look at the data, uh, levofloxacin is a respiratory fluoroquinolone. There are three of them. LMG is the mnemonic. Levofloxacin, then is moxifloxacin and that is gemifloxacin. I repeat once again the respiratory fluoroquinolones we use our lmg that is levofloxacin moxifloxacin and gemifloxacin so uh, this is gonna be option number b as the correct answer i think majority of guys have uh, nailed this one also correctly and is a repeat one okay uh, uh when to use ceftriaxon alone empirical no doctor empirical means ceftriaxone empirical i could not understand your question doctor uh option a would have given icu okay um, uh, amoxicillin uh, even then doctor uh, we have not given uh, coverage no if it was amoxiclav with azithromycin it would have made sense suppose you know he made a very interesting point he said suppose this was icu and would you have not answered amoxicillin with azithromycin no because i if i add amoxiclav and then i'm using uh, azithromycin it makes sense because alone if i'm using a beta lactam and I'm not giving coverage with clavulanic acid, it would not be the correct option to go ahead with. So we always need to give, uh, I mean, we need to ensure that the case is being given proper coverage. Like we're giving ampicillin with sulbactam. So we are protecting ampicillin beta lactam ring also. No? Otherwise, uh, it would be uh, it would be a case where we'll, we will not be able to uh, manage the patient effectively. Uh, meningitis me ceftriaxone vancomycin haan ji dono hi dete dono dete yes we use both of them empirically a uh, treatment combination based on scores okay 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 uh, doctor if the score is uh, if the score of the patient is uh, let me say uh, you know uh, the score turns out to be let me say zero then or zero to one then the mortality rates would be very very minimal or let me say if it is one and the only the age is a criteria, but he's a retired person from Indian Army and he's 70 years of age, but he's very fit and he goes for a morning walk and unfortunately suffered from a pneumonia. So if the score of the patient is turning out to be zero to one and let me say the only the age is fitting in, he's 70 year old, but he's very fit. And I said he has always had, I have never even had crocin tablet in my life. I mean, so fit is, he says, Mujhe to bukhar bhi aaya. even in COVID, I was perfectly fine. So I'll say, okay, not a problem. We'll go ahead with an OPD basis treatment. But if it is a score of two, then we always go in for an IPD based treatment. If it is a score of three, we always go in for an ICU based treatment. And instead of IPD, we can be using HD or high dependency unit as well. So it's based on the scores that the individual treatments would be done. I think this is what you were trying to ask probably that how would we decide whatever is the score in this patient? Okay, when here to use vancomycin. Okay, that's a very good one, Sneha. You'll use vancomycin in this patient in case uh, he has previously been hospitalized. If there is a risk factor for staph aureus, you see, uh, if you look at this table, in the table he mentions that if it is prior respiratory isolation, if he's already, you know, had had a pneumonia episode, uh, in those circumstances, we will have to give coverage for MRSA or coverage for pseudomonas as well. If it's a re recurrent hospitalizations, we'll have to add coverage for, uh, uh, for pseudomonas aeruginosa as well. So I hope doctor that answers your query for when would we answer vancomycin for this particular case that if there is a prior respiratory isolation a previous episode where the person required hospitalization but in this case there's no information given for any, any prior hospitalization I mean this is the first episode of pneumonia for this patient. Uh, 
एम आर एस ए फिडोक्सा मेन नो डॉक्टर एम आर एस ए नहीं आई थिंक यू मिक्सिंग विथ सूडो मेम्बरस कोलाइटिस सो इट इज फॉर सूडो मेम्बरस कोलाइटिस यू विल हैव टू फॉर सूडो मेम्बरस कोलाइटिस इट इज फेडोमाइसिन एंड आई थिंक इट वॉज सम मिस टाइपिंग दैट एम आर एस ए केम इन सो एम आर एस ए इज वैंकोमाइसिन ओके एम आर एस ए इज वैंकोमाइसिन एंड इफ इट इज वी आर एस ए दैन वी यूज लिनेजोलिड इन द पेशेंट uh traditionally for uh, b uh, for vr uh, sa we will be using uh, primarily vancomycin as staphorius we are going to be using uh, primarily uh, daptomycin but especially for pneumonia episodes for vr sa it is linezolid and for mr sa it would be vancomycin uh no 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 doctor i think i've cleared now daptomycin is not the answer for pneumonia case if it is vr sa pneumonia I think I cleared that. If it is VRS pneumonia, then it is not daptomycin. Then it is linezolid. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, ji. I think we sorted for question number six, and we move on to the seventh one, seventh one for today. Absolutely, absolutely. A uh, forty-five-year-old man. Uh, yeah, we make uh, we use mupirocin in topical staphylococcus infection. empirical is when the culture report has not come and definitive is when the culture report has come like if the culture report itself says mrs had detected vrs had detected then based on culture sensitivity we'll add antibiotics in the patient you see if person has already had a hospitalization then i'll add vancomycin straight away empirical basically means when patient comes initially what will we do and definitive is based on the culture sensitivity reports uh this lung cancer patient is having increased urinary cortisol so that means that this chap would be having uh, uh acquiry cushing syndrome uh there is a ectopic source of uh, acth in this particular guy and this uh, ectopic acth uh, will be causing development of hyperpigmentation of the parmal and the sole creases and the neurotransmitter which is responsible for this is uh, pomc that is pro opio melanocortin this pro opio melanocortin will get fragmented into producing acth and then msh that is melanocyte stimulating hormone and uh, because of this uh, we are going to start having hyperpigmentation i mean the ectopic source what the ectopic source is producing in this case the lung cancer is producing is pomc and the pomc is then going to cleave into two products and it's going to contribute to development of uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone manifestation and uh, subsequently i mean that hyperpigmentation of palmer and sole creases would be seen in this case yep yep c peptide is related to insulin so you can rule that out hemosiderin is a pigment so you can rule that out so it only bit a neuropeptide uh, y and pomc neuropeptide y is again related to uh, i would say uh, i mean it's mostly a, a molecule that would be related to pain Uh, or uh, pain perception in a patient so by exclusion also we can work out the answer to this question as option number a let's look at uh, the eighth one for today this says that uh, this is a 80 year old man and uh, he is uh, unfortunately expired due to pneumonia and the brain biopsy of this patient is showing presence of neurofibrillary tangles uh, which of the following is correct about this patient if i say anything more it will become easier for you to work up uh small cell cancer paraneoplastic manifestation okay yep okay so uh okay yes yes guys uh, waiting for your answers in this case uh, neurofibrillary angles i'm getting b as an answer so i think you guys answered the previous questions beautifully and now uh, you know a little bit of lapse of concentration if i say neurofibrillary angles it would be alzheimer's disease that would be taken into consideration and if we are taking anti alzheimer's disease as a consideration then resting tremors and bradykinesia cannot be the answer so answer will not be b and uh, do we get visual hallucinations in alzheimer's disease no because visual hallucinations are mostly a feature with dementia with lewy bodies as compared to alzheimer's disease so two options can be ruled out we are left between two now that is a versus c let me now see what are the correct options that people are answering yes now i think uh, the car is on the right track that in patients who are having alzheimer's disease uh, there would be a there would be a involvement of the entorhinal cortex so yep the answer of this question would be option number a 
and if you look at the it is written global deterioration of consciousness with preserved memory ulta hota na it is global deterioration of memory with preserved consciousness alzheimer's disease will not be having deterioration of consciousness patient will be totally aware of his surroundings i mean he knows you know that uh, uh, i mean in, if a person is unconscious then he'll be lying with his eyes closed uh, he'll not be able to at least move around but in alzheimer's disease person will be <coughs> wandering aimlessly so that wandering aimlessly means that the person is conscious and is aware of the surroundings yes we cannot have preserved memory it is always the episodic memory which is to be affected so the correct answer for this one is option number a great great uh, uh, mushahid khan if you got this one correct that's great yes impaired consciousness uh, with preserved memory that would be more of a delirium manifestation okay oh that is really really sad uh, to know you know it's a, it's a very sad disease to have actually in the family you know people forgetting things and uh, especially your loved ones when they when they start doing you know uh, they'll forget they drank water you know yesterday only i was uh, interacting i'll not get into more details but yes i was interacting with somebody and they said that is why like she goes into the kitchen again and again and she drinks water she forgets she's drunk water again says i want to drink water and then she drinks so much of water they start puking so it's it's a really unfortunate thing to when you know you when you listen to uh, people telling you those things about uh, some uh, basic things in life which we don't even think about you know drinking water and then person is forgetting it and trying to do it again okay uh, cause of hypernatremia in older people yes frailty is one of the reasons in in uh, these patients ah. okay okay so i did not understand the pun a pun intended <laughs> Uh, PCM, I did not understand the pun intended. Fun, fine, fine. So, ठीक है, ठीक है, fine, fine, fine. You know, disease के साथ में थोड़ा सा मतलब वो मतलब loved one में हो जाए तो यार बुरा लगता है मतलब वो ठीक है हंसी मजाक में तो it's it's okay. Pneumonia is the leading cause of death in all uh, uh, in all neurodegenerative conditions. <laughs> नहीं वो सेकंड मेमोरी हो जाती है ना दवाई लिख लिख के आदत हो जाती है और तुम्हें भी हो जाएगी पता तुम भी भूलना शुरू कर दोगे अभी तुम्हें मजाक लग रहा है है ना बिकॉज यू गैस यंग एंड ट्वेंटी फोर ट्वेंटी फाइव ईयर ऑफ एज तो तुम्हें लग रहा है कि हाँ हाँ ठीक है ना वैन यू विल भी फोर्टी फोर्टी फाइव ना तो वैन यू गेट द वर्क प्रेशर एंड एवरी थिंग वन यू स्टार्ट फॉर गेटिंग थिंग्स चलो अगले सवाल पे आते हैं विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज नॉट एसोसिएटेड विद टाइप ए लैक्टिक एसिडोसिस सो टाइप ए लैक्टिक एसिडोसिस इज ऑलवेज एसोसिएटेड विद सर्कुलेटरी फेलियर लाइक इन वायरल मायोकार्डाइटिस यू सी बिकॉज द हार्ट विल बी फेलिंग सो परफ्यूजन ऑफ टिश्यूज विल बी लेस एंड इफ परफ्यूजन ऑफ द टिश्यूज इज लेस देन लैक्टिक एसिड विल बी प्रोड्यूस सेम इज द केस विद सेप्टिक शॉक ऑल्सो आई मीन द शॉक मीन्स परफ्यूजन ऑफ द टिश्यूज इज लेस एंड लैक्टिक एसिड विल बी प्रोड्यूस एंड इन साइनाइड टॉक्सिसिटी Uh, the availability of oxygen to the tissues would be less because cyanide toxicity will cause histotoxic hypoxia and because of this histotoxic hypoxia component because cells are not getting oxygen they switch to anaerobic mode of respiration and that explains uh, type a lactic acidosis but if you look at uh, option number d then uh, you can very well see that it is due to a drug whenever it's a drug or a metabolic cause whenever it's drugs mentioned like metformin or uh, uh fen formin or chronic renal failure diabetic nephropathy uh then you always have to answer that as type b lactic acidosis it's an artificial classification that has been made the concept is that type a is used whenever there is a under perfusion of tissues or there is less availability of oxygen to the tissues and type b is for metabolic reasons type b is for uh, if it is drugs being responsible or uh, you know renal failure or diabetic nephropathy being responsible so this was a you know a quick spotter that you guys were able to pick up the answer to this question is option number d yes yes okay so uh, associated with or it can it may not be associated okay which of which of the following does not cause type a lactic acidosis that could be better framing of this one great uh this is the repeat one let's look at your inputs here everything is turning out to be negative uh, surface antigen is negative the protection antibody is negative e antigen is negative anti e is negative but he mentioned total anti hbc positive uh i'll rule out the options in this case uh, when he says uh, uh, chronic hepatitis b then for chronic you need two things chronic has to be with surface antigen positivity and along with that you need the uh, presence of igg class of antibody to the core antigen so what i can say at the moment is because surface antigen is turning out to be negative in the case it cannot be chronic hepatitis uh, b 
then uh, gap period will be having only one thing present that is IgM antibody to the core antigen. We need IgM antibody for that. Here it is written total antibody to core. Total is a combination of IgM plus IgG. The meaning of the word total is that it is IgM as well as IgG both present. So we cannot call it a gap period because that will require only one that is IgM plus of antibody. So we are left between two options. Let's have a quick voting and let's look at the quick answers that you guys are giving in this case. Yes, why is this not an inactive carrier? Then this is not an inactive carrier because of the fact that inact I mean, even if it is an inactive carrier, the surface antigen is still positive. Even in the inactive carrier, guys, the surface antigen is still positive. Uh, this report is basically picked up from the CDC website, the Center for Disease Control Atlanta website, where uh, everything is negative, negative, and only the antibody score antigen is positive. That is suggestive of an infection that would have occurred in uh, uh, remote past for this particular chap and I'm just showing you a snapshot of the CDC website where I mean this scenario is given the routine parameters are negative and only the total antibody to core antigen is given and that's where he talks about the resolved infection in the previous past and the same thing is also given in Harrison so I'll show you a table from Harrison where there can be four combinations for surface antigen positivity and four combinations for surface antigen negativity of four combinations i i there are eight entries in the table in harrison and four are with surface antigen positive starting and four would be having surface antigen negativity you need to focus on those mcqs where surface antigen negative is given now if you get a question in which surface antigen is negative and the security system is present security system is antibody against the surface antigen that means that this particular individual has uh, probably recovered or is vaccinated how do i know I, he has recovered because there is igg class of antibody present so i'm gonna call it a recovery you see the security system is present if security system is present without immunoglobulin g this is the security system and security system is present without immunoglobulin G that means he is immunized that he took vaccine like us so every time you see a report of negative surface antigen check out security system is there or not if security system is plus then check out IgG class of antibodies present or not if it is present you will say recovery if it is negative you will say immunization and uh, that would help solve two questions related to surface antigen negativity now let's look at two situations where surface antigen is negative and the security system is also absent there you will have to answer on the basis of uh, 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 IgM and IgG class of antibody and IgG class of antibody either it will be a low level carrier low level carrier and inactive carrier is not the same there are two dev terms one is low level carrier and second is inactive carrier inactive carrier will always be having this is a data from Harrison he says that inactive carrier also has the surface antigen positivity so Please remember the fact that if this report or in this MCQ, if it was written low level carrier, then question would have been tricky and could be a possibility that there might have been two correct answers in the question because lots of time in uh, in INISAT, there could be multiple correct options, which is low level carrier and hepatitis B in remote past. Check out the table which is presented. You can see in the table, this is the report I'm talking about. Everything is given from the textbook. Everything is given from the textbook. This is the commonest report that they're asking. So I want you to be very, very clear about the fact that if they give you this IgG class of antibody with everything else turning out to be negative or total antibody to the core antigen, uh, either it's going to be a low level carrier or it's going to be hepatitis B in remote past. Both of them are possibilities. In the last time's exam, it was not low level carrier given, it was inactive carrier given, which is why I was able to rule it out and answer it as uh, remote past. But I would like you guys to be very thorough with this report per se. And uh, if you can just take a snapshot of it or you, you can check out in the PDF subsequently, you will be able to get this one correct. So yes, 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 yes. I think most guys have got the concept correct for this one. So yes, this was a good an answer. Then is the ISPAD guidelines uh, which are repeatedly being asked. They were asked in uh, NEET exam first time, last time 2023 March. Then they asked that in uh, the FMG exam and now, uh, I mean, INISET again this was asked. So three exams in last one year, they've asked about International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes. They've asked these guidelines with respect to the fact that the bolus insulin has now been removed. Uh, if they ask you about adult diabetes, if they ask you about adult with type 1, adult with type 2 diabetes going into diabetic ketoacidosis, please answer it. The standard data that I have discussed in the app, that standard data from Harrison, there is no change in the guidelines for adults. 
the change is in only for pediatric age group i repeat this once again that bolus insulin has been removed in the ispad guidelines that is for uh, pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis so what whenever you are answering please be sure about the fact that the question is about a child because diabetic ketoacidosis can occur in an adult also dka can be occurring in an adult also post myocardial infarction post stroke in a patient then you will answer bolus insulin also okay guys let's have a quick inputs for this one a child is brought in an unconscious state after severe vomiting and abdominal pain and the heart rate is on the higher side 100 per minute not very fast but yeah on the higher side bp is 100 by 60 i'm a little worried because uh, he looks to be dehydrated because of this vomiting component ph shows acidosis there is ketones also present so there is a ketoacidosis present plus blood sugar is also elevated so a standard presentation of dka is given in this case in all of these patients he says that you first have to correct the dehydration of the patient first correct dehydration of the patient give iv fluid to this patient and after one hour when you have corrected the dehydration component subsequently a insulin drip in the chap can be started the correct answer for this one is option number a and if they twist the MCQ, the twist in the question can be that they can mention the child to be in shock. If he says the child has presented in shock, then you will not answer straight away. I mean, you'll, you'll then answer bolus IV fluid. Then you'll not say that I'll give IV fluid uh, uh, the routine correction. You'll say I will first give bolus till the pulse comes back to normal. Then it would be three steps. No, first I give boluses. The boluses would be at a rate of 20 ml per kilogram till I get a pulse and then I will be giving a correction fluid to this patient based on the body weight that would be something in the range of about 20 ml per kg. So there would be two shots or two or maybe three shots that are required. Two boluses were given, maybe or one bolus was given and then the remaining fluid for correction of dehydration would be given to a patient. Then another twist in the MCQ can be patient is taking orally. If the patient is taking orally, then you will say you will give subcutaneous insulin to the patient and since he is tolerating oral fluid, there is no need for IV fluids in the case. So in the ISP guidelines, uh, there are three possibilities and uh, uh, the bolus insulin has been removed because they said it causes a sudden fluid shift across the brain. Uh, it causes worsening of cerebral edema because usually patients of diabetic ketoacidosis die primarily because the leading cause of death in diabetic ketoacidosis happens to be cerebral edema. Uh, and uh, that, that can be worsened by a bolus dose of insulin. So they remove that. But uh, these are three permutation combinations that I have currently shown you with respect to what can happen in a case with DKA. And in all of them, before we start insulin drip, additional point is uh, check out the potassium values. Do not give potassium to these patients. Do not give potassium to these patients if, uh, I mean, uh, do not start insulin drip if the potassium is less. Uh, somebody put up a question, IV fluid followed by, yeah, yeah, doctor, that is what I'm saying now. I can be using subcutaneous insulin, but then it is not going in the form of a drip. It is always a insulin drip. It is always a insulin drip which is recommended and not a subcutaneous insulin. Since the child is in a state of dehydration, he says you have to give it in the form of an insulin drip subsequently. So why it is not D is IV fluid is okay, but uh, since the child is not in a position or is not in good shape, I would like to give it in form of an insulin drip as compared to subcutaneous. In emergency, if you cannot obtain an IV line, that things are different, but routinely, I mean, that intervention can be can be handled. Uh, adult diabetic ketoacidosis, doctor, uh, we'll uh, give uh, bolus insulin, that is initial, uh, then we'll give IV fluids and insulin drip simultaneously. Unlike in children where he's saying first correct the dehydration component, here it is bolus insulin, then IV fluids and insulin drip simultaneously. You can put two cannulas, one for IV fluid, second for insulin drip or you can use a, a three-way and you can give it uh, with help of uh, you know, the insulin drip. And then, uh, yes, if the child is, yes, Ankit, you are right in your statement. It is fluid to be given before insulin infusion, bolus to be avoided and if child is not dehydrated, absolutely subcutaneous insulin. Uh, doctor, these are new guidelines which they have uh, documented because the leading cause of death in adults usually is not cerebral edema. In children, it's usually cerebral edema. So the sudden fluid shifts are the reasons why he is saying this. Uh, yeah, Mushahid, we do not give a bolus in, uh, it's not required in hyperosmolar coma. In hyperosmolar coma, fluids are more than sufficient because uh, it would be a high blood sugar, 600 or something. When you give fluids like normal saline, it will help in improvement. 
and you can use ringer lactate also you know i get a lot of queries yeah, sir should we not give ringer lactate because you're saying potassium is less ringer lactate can be given guys but he says like this that ringer lactate has very little limited potassium ringer lactate has very limited potassium the amount of potassium in ringer lactate is only four milliequivalents so that will not be sufficient so what i can do in the patient is i can give normal saline plus kcl this kcl will provide that substantial uh, you know this will ensure that i am safe with respect to my insulin drip because insulin drip always causes potassium to go inside the cells so if i'm giving only ringer lactate i'm not safe with respect to potassium but if i give normal saline plus kcl then i am safe with my insulin drip as well and uh, another reason for giving kcl in the patient is that he has been having vomiting also okay when to do abg abg would be done on admission doctor when the patient comes uh, we'll have to do an abg i mean any patient with uh, suspected metabolic encephalopathy uh, we have to do a arterial blood gas analysis in the patient uh, why can't we give iv insulin in the bottle of iv so doctor how will you regulate the rate now because fluid has to be given very fast insulin drip has to be given uh, relatively slow because you need a continuous infusion so if you are going to add it to the bottle of iv fluid then the rate for both of them is different now so he's saying that it is better that you first give fluid fast and get the dehydration problem sorted because that will reduce the ketonemia anyway and then you can you know coolly give insulin drip to the patient so that will make more sense because trying to rush into you know the management of a person and in one hour only you trying to do too many things would not be very well justified okay when to start kcl kcl is to be started in all cases uh, because vomiting will be having hypokalemia we anyway do serum potassium but serum potassium will always be low why because person had been vomiting the whole night before or the whole day before so normal saline plus kcl is anyway to be given and the summary is ki our final jo hai wo ye hai i'll, I'll give a summary because jyada ho gaya isme the summary is pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis mein karna kya hai first treat the dehydration if it is shock give bolus but the pulse is not palpable if pulse is palpable you give uh then you don't give bolus you give fluid at 20 ml per kilogram and after one hour you give insulin drip to the patient if he can take orally you have to give subcutaneous insulin that is the final summary yes yes doctor that's the final summary mai fir se bol deta hu hai na summary pediatric dk ki ye hai ki agar wo circulatory failure mein hoga to aapne kya karna hai usko pehle aapne normal saline ka bolus dena jab tak pulse wapas nahi aati ab wo aa gaya middle wale part mein in the middle wala part what you gonna do is you are gonna give for 20 ml per kg of fluid after one hour you are gonna give insulin drip plus kcl kcl anyway has to be added to uh, i mean uh, i mean normal saline bottle subsequently also which will be going because first hour ke baad mein bhi you will have to give maintenance fluid to the patient he cannot take orally so to the bottle of maintenance fluid you add kcl and insulin drip would be going simultaneously okay ji fine uh bolus uh, point point 1 units doctor okay uh these values uh, doctor you don't need to remember these values they are just uh, put in to uh, trouble you i mean obviously in the table there are, there are lot of data given 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kilogram what you need to focus is on the core issue he simply asking you ki pehle kya karoge baad mein kya karoge so all you need to answer is first fluids and then insulin drip to the patient if you can remember the doses that is great but i don't think so that dosages will ever time be a challenge at any point of time okay ji sorted for this one let's uh, take care of one more a uh, patient has developed hyperpigmentation i think this is the repeated one the last one a patient has developed a hyperpigmentation of the distal fingers after being hospitalized post adrenalectomy and he says which of the following is cause there so because you are removing the adrenal gland from the body of the patient A removal of adrenal gland basically means that the check mechanism on ACTH release is gone. Now what will happen is that the ACTH release will be unregulated, and because ACTH release is unregulated, and because of the partial MSH like activity, there would be hyperpigmentation of the fingers or the palm and the sole creases, and this is what is technically called as Nielsen syndrome. Addison disease would be primarily because of either autoimmune destruction or because of TB. So that will be causing deficiency of aldosterone and cortisol. Kohn syndrome is a tumor in the first layer of the gland. Uh, it's a adrenal adenoma. It will only be having increased aldosterone values. 
and Cushing syndrome has multiple causes the leading one being intake of steroids so we could have solved this question even by exclusion also sensing the fact that uh, the remaining options are more of like you know dummy options uh, just because he wanted us to talk about Nelson syndrome this is a repeat from the last time uh, exam let's look at the next one on the screen now yes yes uh, let's focus on the next one now नेल्सन सिंड्रोम क्या होता है डॉक्टर अगर एडल गैंड निकाल दिया ना पेशेंट का तो ए बढ़ जाता है और ए बढ़ने से हाइपर पिगमेंटेशन हो जाती है पाम एंड सोल क्रीजेस की दैट्स पोस्ट एडल एक्मी बायोलैट्रल एडल एक्मी ना पेशेंट ओके गाइस लेट्स वेट फॉर कौन सिंड्रोम में क्या था इन्वेस्टिगेशन इज सलाइन इन्फ्यूजन या डॉक्टर इन कॉन सिंड्रोम वी गो इन फॉर सलाइन इन्फ्यूजन टेस्ट एज अ इनिशियल टेस्ट फॉर डायग्नोसिस फर्स्ट वी गो इन फॉर एडोस्ट्रॉन देन इन रेशो बट देन इज सलाइन इन्फ्यूजन टेस्ट ओके गाइज द नेक्स्ट वन इज रिगार्डिंग हाइपर कलीमिक एसिडोसिस सो डायरिया विल बी कॉजिंग हाइपो कलीमिया दो इट विल कॉज एसिडोसिस बिकॉज देर वुड बी अ सर्क्यूलेटरी फेलियर इन द पेशेंट कॉन सिंड्रोम इज हैविंग मोर ऑफ एल्डोस्ट्रॉन more aldosterone will always contribute to urinary loss of potassium and hydrogen i drawn this diagram i think up to th number of times aldosterone will be causing gain of salt and water that's okay that will explain the hypertension component but the bad news is there would be a urinary loss of potassium and hydrogen so every time you read the word hyperaldosteronism what should always click in your mind is the word hypokalemic alkalosis the question is mentioning hyperkalemic acidosis so i can rule out these two options uh, diabetic patient with severe vomiting will be having uh, again dehydration this dehydration will again contribute to increase of aldosterone and uh, as i explained that if there is increase of aldosterone it will cause hypokalemic alkalosis so the correct answer would be hemolytic uremic syndrome the kidney will fail every time the kidney will fail it will have inability to excrete hydrogen inability to excrete the protons that inability to excrete hydrogen and protons are the ones uh, uh dr vivek uh, you know usme uh, matlab why to mess around you know matlab ab seedhe seedha kaam kar lenge na we'll uh, uh, it was a interesting comment ki sir why are you not adding uh, kcl to ringer lactate bhai usme pehle se potassium hai to main why to you know uh, i would say play around with fluids लेट्स को सिंपल नॉर्मल स्लाइन में केसीएल ऐड कर दो तो आपको एक्यूरेट जो देना है करेक्शन वो करेक्शन आप दे सकते हो अगर उसका पोटेशियम लेस आ रहा तो डायलिसिस इन दिस पेशेंट नो डॉक्टर नॉट एग्जैक्टली मोस्ट केसेस दे माइट बी रिकवरी बट यस इफ इफ द हाइपर क्लिमिक एसिडोसिस डज नॉट रिस्पॉन्ड टू मेडिकेशन वी माइट हैव टू डू अ डायलिसिस इन दिस पेशेंट most of the time we'll try to medically manage first we'll give packed rbc infusions we'll stop antibiotics in hemolytic uremic syndrome we'll treat hyperkalemia with drugs we'll treat metabolic acidosis with soda bicarbonate if it still persists then we'll plan doing a hemodialysis in this patient answer 13 is option number c let's move on to the 14th one uh, a patient has diarrhea diabetes dermatitis and dementia and he says which of the following is the cause of this presentation uh deepak kumar i could not uh, get uh, the question for fluid of choice uh, for metabolic acidosis is ringer lactate and for metabolic alkalosis is normal saline if you were asking something else uh, let me know uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome may have a bloody vomiting uh, no doctor unlikely a uh, patient you know any any vomiting because uremia will cause the person to have vomiting so uh, urea irritates the stomach so the vomiting part is very very severe so maybe there could be some retching that could have resulted in uh, some damage to the lower esophageal sphincter but otherwise routinely in hemolytic uremic syndrome it would be pallor with acute kidney injury and uh, yes if it is uremic uh, uremia is not treated then uh, uremic hiccups uh, gastritis component vomiting will be present okay so let's look at the answers from your side quickly here uh, yes 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 uh, in this particular case guys uh, no 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 it is not nice and deficiency because there is diabetes now this is four d's that are present and uh, because of the four d's which are present in this particular case uh, diabetes is a feature that would be seen because this is a patient on a pancreatic uh, 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 endocrine tumor this patient could be having a query glucagonoma 
and uh, glucagonoma also has d's which look like that of a patient on maize diet but the diabetes part had to be picked up in this particular case exactly exactly that is what i'm trying to say the diabetes part has to be picked up and in fact in your exam the question was one step ahead and he mentioned that uh, he asked the skin manifestation of this patient that skin manifestation of glucagonoma would be necrolytic migratory yeah 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 depression and yep can be dementia component can be present doctor yes yes ne necrolytic uh, migratory erythema is an association that is present uh you right doctor depression but then depression can result in pseudo dementia no? the the logic which i can give here for why dementia what is given is that depression people with depression they always underperform in mini mentals for examination and uh, that is why you also read about depression patients exhibiting features of what is referred as pseudo dementia so that's what i can say that why the forgetfulness is coming because of the depression component in this chart so that answers you very doctor uh, lagging uh, behind uh, okay ओके ओके नो नो डॉक्टर शेरिन आई थिंक इट्स जस्ट दैट वो कुछ सही हो रहे हैं पीछे वाले रिपीट है ना तो उस वजह से वो हमें लगता है कि यार ये वाला भी होगा इसमें थोड़ा सा ट्विस्ट आ जाएगा तो आई थिंक वी आर सॉर्टेड नाउ ऑन दिस वन अल्कोहल एंड विड्रॉल सिम्टम्स विल बी डेलीरियम ट्रेमर्स द सिम्टम प्रोफाइल विल बी क्रॉसली डिफरेंट एंड चाइल्ड विद परसिस्टेंट डायरिया विल हैव इलेक्ट्रोलाइट इंबैलेंसेस मसल क्रैम्स वीकनेस हाइपोकैलीमिया हाइपोमैग्नीसीमिया सो अनलाइकली एज एन आंसर okay so we sorted with 14th let's do another one guys uh, that is the 15th one so that is the last one for this session and then i have another session planned in the evening where i'll take care of more questions so we are going to do about 35 odd questions today and uh, the first 15 are the ones what the ones which i am catering to at the moment so for this session this would be the last one that we doing and then we have another one planned in the evening uh okay yes guys uh, no 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 absolutely not but that's why we vg that is why we calling it as pseudo dementia no uh, because uh, this would not be having any structural changes in the brain okay yes guys uh, let's look at the next one uh, you have to answer as 1 2 3 4 instead of like a b c d because i'm not able to usually pick it up but anyway uh, i am having a patient a young lady blood work showing low tsh with raised t4 and t3 so the diagnosis in this patient is graves disease and in graves disease we will not be having uh, constipation will be having diarrhea will be having proptosis so i mean option number a and b are like outrightly in your face uh, these cannot be features we are left between the two options here diffuse enlargement of thyroid gland uh, diffuse enlargement of thyroid gland is uh, seen in goiter but it is also seen in graves disease also i mean graves also has a diffuse enlargement of the thyroid gland and because of the sympathomimetic stimulation in these patients uh, the systolic bp will tend to rise and when the systolic bp will rise then the pulse pressure will also rise and because the pulse pressure is rising that is why we are saying a widened pulse pressure so there are two things which are okay in this question that is t and d which will nail the diagnosis in this particular question or the answer to this question as option number c yes 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 uh the correct answer is option number 3 i got a few miscorrects there as well but i think uh, drooping of eyelids so i think jaldbazi mein answer kar diya hoga that uh, uh, that would be uh, ulta na it's proptosis where the drooping of eyelids would not happen in fact in the very first place i mean ptosis would be totally different uh infections okay doctor i'll try to do that so these were inputs from my side for uh, this particular part of the session and we're going to do another session in the evening so uh, we'll practice again so thank you so much for joining with me and uh, uh, i'm going to see you again 5 o'clock doctor is the time and in case you have any queries my email id i'll just uh, type in the chat you can just drop in your queries uh, for the same and uh, yep those initiated going going students uh, my humble request again is that in 6.0 do listen to the infective endoca that is update uh, it will hardly take 15 minutes of your time but that will just help you refresh your data the traditional data for infective endoca that is that you have uh, already studied so you are doing the right thing uh, uh, diarrhea is causing acidosis okay okay panthan uh, that's a very easy one no diarrhea will cause under perfusion now because you are losing fluid from the body if you lose fluid from the body if tissues will be having less perfusion then they switch to anaerobic respiration 
and when you say when you switch to anaerobic respiration then lactic acid gets produced and that is why metabolic acidosis will start happening in the patient the concept is diarrhea always causes under perfusion any condition no whenever, whenever you have to think of metabolic acidosis now just check out is this condition causing deficiency of oxygen to tissue or is it causing under perfusion of the tissue and you would be sorted so i think doctor i answered you there uh and you, you can drop in your uh drop in your questions in this particular case acid based compensation doctor uh, main section is where the compensation part has been taken care of but anyway i'll try to do some part in the subsequent part so thank you guys god bless you take care and uh, i'm gonna see you again uh pdf would be in uh, yeah doctor after the second session no, the pdf would come up uh, the link will be in the description of the video calcium channel blocker contraindication in arrhythmia okay okay Fine, doctor. I'll do that. Uh, Coxella Barnetti, doctor, we'll uh, prefer doing an antibody test or we can do a PCR or we can do a metagenomic sequencing. That would help you. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.